Welcome to CFRI's Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the Cystic Fibrosis Community. Hi, everybody. I am Siri Vaith, Executive Director of CFRI, and I am so thrilled to welcome you all to our online town hall discussion about the movie Five Feet Apart. Um, we have been so thrilled at CFRI with the response to this. Obviously, the movie has generated tremendous uh, discussion and varying opinions. Um, and so when we put this up and had this idea to hold it, we had no idea that almost immediately about over 50 people had signed up before we blinked. And so um, we have a lot of people online from all across the country, <coughs> and I welcome you all. So this is the first time we've done something like this. So we have people on Zoom who can discuss you know, and have registered. We also have people participating and watching via Facebook Live. And then we have here people in the studio in CFRI's offices. So I am holding my breath that technology does not fail us. And I am asking for your patience in advance in case there are glitches. We will power through. So before we go any further, I do want to thank our sponsors of this event, which will be turned into a podcast. Um, then our sponsors are Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Gilead Sciences, and Chiesi USA, with additional support from AbbVie. So thank you to them. So uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a couple points. One, obviously there have been a wide range of opinions about this film. We've all read multiple blogs and articles. Um, quite often uh, a touch point for people is the issue of infection control. We know that can be somewhat of a lightning rod in our community. And I just want to again stress that one's beliefs and actions around the issue of infection control are intensely personal. Um, and then, you know, from what I've read of other blogs, there are other issues, the portrayal of the individuals with CF, um, you know, the things about transplant, there are many, many issues. But I think what I, I really want to stress in advance is that we all know this, but I'll say it anyway so I feel better, um, that we really treat each other with respect and courtesy. And if somebody has a differing view, this is not a time to debate people. This is really your opportunity to share your own thoughts and opinions. So now let me move to the technical part. Um, we hope everybody's mics are muted. I believe so. Um, what will happen if you wish to speak once we you know, launch a topic and you want to speak, if you're on Zoom, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, I believe, a section that says participants. And if you click on that, you'll see a hand. And you can click on that to raise your hand. And uh, Mary Convento, who is here in the CFRI office, uh, you can't see her on camera, but she does have a mic. She will be monitoring the hands going up and unmuting. So when she calls your name, you'll hear her. She should have a mic. Um, then you will need to unmute yourself, and she will unmute you from here, and you'll be able to speak. Um, I do want to apologize in advance if not everyone gets to speak. Again, when we had over 50 people uh, sign up, and this probably tonight will go around 75 minutes, we just won't have time. But um, so thank you for your understanding. And then the last thing is just an etiquette thing on my part and on Jacob's part, because um, when we're talking and looking at the camera, we're, you know, we're having sort of eye contact. But when you're speaking, I don't have, Jacob and I don't have anything in front of us. So the way we see you is on the screen behind us, which means that when you start talking, it kind of looks like we're turning our backs on you, but we're not. We're actually uh, just trying to see your face as you speak. So let's get started. We're going to just, because there are so many things about this film that we could discuss, we're going to break it into about five different segments. Um, we're going to start really at the macro level and um, talk about it just to launch it. The, the film's impact on the general public. So as of last uh, Monday, the film had generated, had earned over $26 million in U.S. markets and over $6 million in foreign markets. It was the third most viewed film its first weekend out. Clearly, it's having a broad impact across, to, for many people who may know nothing about CF. Um, so I'm curious what, how people feel or what they believe the impact of this film will be upon specifically people who do not know anything about CF or did not know anything. So to launch the discussion, I'm going to turn to Jacob and let him speak, and then Mary will be monitoring um, the hands being raised. So Jacob. 
Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very wonderful to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I had no idea what the impact would be. I was very interested to see how people would respond to the film. Um, both people like within my family who are aware of the disease and kind of aware of the things that I go through, um, as well as people completely outside of that. And so I know like leading up to the film, I was getting a bazillion messages all the time. Do you know there's a movie coming out about your disease? Do you, have you heard about Five Feet Apart? I said, yes. I've heard. What do you think about it? I said, I don't know. I haven't seen it. So um, I was really eager to see exactly you know, what the film had to say and um, the kind of the response. And I think broadly, uh, there's, I'm sure, different interpretations and people take what they want from the film, but it generates interest in the disease. I know I've had a number of conversations with people who, you know, I know kind of informally um, about some very intense topics. People asking me um, how often I think about death, how often, you know, what about planning for my future? How do I do that? Um, under, like, what is it like being in the hospital? It has generated questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love questions because it gives us an opportunity in our community to share our story, to educate, and to kind of spread those issues and to kind of bring some real uh, concrete details to kind of this Hollywood aspect of things. Um, and so I was really happy at the, at least the, the curiosity that the film brought to our community. Um, and the opportunity to really kind of fill in those kind of vague spots or some kind of misconceptions that the film created mm -hmm. um, with testimony about, you know, how I have interacted with CF and, and my own personal story with it. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was very happy overall with that, uh, with that impact. Great, great. Mary, has anybody raised their hand? There she is. <laughs> Hi, Beth. <laughs> That's a little scary. <laughs> I hurt my leg, so I hurt my leg, so I'm kind of laying down. <laughs> so don't get don't get alarmed. Um, uh, I, I I know some people may have seen. I wrote a blog post for CF Roundtable that I think yesterday went out about how I loved the movie. And I, uh, as of yesterday, I'd seen it twice. I saw it again today, just since we were having this conversation, and also. Um, because I had one of my best friends in our, who hadn't seen it and I really wanted to go with her. So, I mean, just on, on educating people who don't know anything about CF, I think it's a terrific opportunity for us. Um, and I think, you know, it's a movie, it's a fictional story. I think people know that not every single minute of the movie is going to be exactly uh, the way every person with CF uh, <laughs> uh, lives. But um, from my experience, and you know, that's an experience, I'm 53 years old, so I definitely was in the hospital many times, many, many times in the 90s, many times. <laughs> and I thought um, that, that it was a very accurate uh, depiction of, of CF, and I thought it was uh, just a beautiful story about friendship, uh, you know, for everyone to see. And a beautiful story about people with CF reaching out to each other and caring about each other and the impact of, you know, one of the characters caring for another character and, and how that really <coughs> made him, uh, I think, to be more compliant and to do treatments. And so I think overall, um, <clears throat> it's a great, it's a great thing for our community. And I, and I think it might scare some people because it shows people who are sick. Um, I think I, I talked to Siri about this and I think it's sort of your, your second question, but I'll, I'll say it now, which is that, you know, often I think recently uh, in the past few years in our community, there are a lot of stories of people who are running marathons and climbing mountains and going to medical school and going to law school and I think that stories about people who are sick and how they are navigating their disease are, are much less prominent. And I feel like a lot of people who are facing a lot of challenges from CF feel forgotten. And they feel like that the community doesn't care about their story. And 
and I think we need to really you know make sure that everyone in our community that all of our stories are heard we're all worth uh, we're, we're all worth uh, a lot regardless of of how uh, many health challenges we have and so I think you know if the only thing the movie does is say hey we need to also tell the story of people with CF who aren't you know very healthy because they're on a modulator or who aren't running marathons I think that's so important for us to really accept everyone into our community and and um, give everybody worth and tell everyone's story mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Mary, is there anybody else who has a hand raised? I, I agree um, with Beth. Like, I think that the movie was, um, obviously it had its factual inaccuracies and stuff like that. We'll get but to that. overall, <laughs> I think that the movie does have a positive impact. Um, it's funny, when I was in the theater, are we allowed to talk about like spoilers in the movie or no? I think that pretty much everybody who's logged in here has seen this movie. Okay. And if you haven't okay. seen it, just log off now. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Because <laughs> we're going to be talking about it. <laughs> um, so at the one point in the movie uh, where Stella is like not, um, not breathing and Will has to give her like mouth to mouth, um, for me, it was it was interesting to hear the reactions from the the crowd, like the other people in the theater, who were like screaming, "No, don't do it! You're gonna kill her! Like, don't do it! Oh my God. Don't do it!" I was like, "Oh, okay." So for me, I found that to be, um, well, interesting, right? So like, as a CF patient, I'm like, "Yeah, you can give her sepatia, like that's bad." But to hear that the audience actually like understood that was like really interesting. Like I felt like, oh wow, like they're actually invested in not just this love story, but like the actual repercussions of this illness and the impact it will have on this this young woman. So I found that to be like very um, intriguing. Like I was like taken back by it. I was like, oh, oh, we're vocal. Oh, okay. We're, they're, they're actually like understanding it and not just viewing it as this, you know, teenage love story, and um, that's, you know, fictional, which I mean, in my head, like, it is, but um, now I was on the opposite end, I was like, she's gonna die, just do it, dude, like, come on, <laughs> and the audience was more so like, don't do that, so I found that to be interesting, I think that that plays into the fact that, like, you know, while there are some things that maybe as CS patients we uh, are more critical of or more aware of, the, the general, uh, idea of the movie and and the disease like the people in the audience who were all teenagers by the way um actually seem to understand that i found that like refreshing yeah. and as a positive thing so that they actually are caring enough to be educated about the illness and not just this story that's playing out on the screen right absolutely and you know it's kind of my hope Obviously, I'm, I, for people who don't know me, I have a daughter who has CF, who's 24, um, but also as the director of CFRI, I mean, I'm really hoping that now when we're doing appeals <laughs> for fundraising that people can identify, they have a picture of what this disease is about and what they're supporting and why we would be asking for support because clearly there's a long way to go. So that's, you know, my, my personal right. vested interest in in hoping that awareness has been spread and, you know we are a rare disease and we it is pretty to me remarkable that this hollywood film you know that's has the third highest viewership in its first weekend out about our disease um that it's out there and i'm i agree i think that um yes we and we will drill down into the things that drove us a little crazy but big picture macro level um what a gift to yeah to share the word absolutely you know and a lot of the work we do like when we're in the legislature so I'm a legislative associate here at CFRI and so we're constantly you know working to educate and uh, bring awareness to these policymakers and so it is so nice to have this additional tool in our belt to to kind of point to and say you know when you're thinking about passing these different legislations that directly affect our community you know this is this is what it looks like this is what we're dealing with every day um, and it can be hard because 
that's really the people that we're trying to help. And it's really hard to get the Stellas of the cystic fibrosis community into the legislator, yeah. right? Right. And so how do you right, create this? I'm not exactly the, the best picture when it comes to CF in terms of, well, you guys look healthy. Things, you know, things look right. fine. What, you know, what, what would, why do you need more help? Mm -hmm. And it's because there's still this so much, this large part of our community that needs our help and, and needs that support. And so it is so nice to have you know the movie here to kind of point to that and really paint mm -hmm. that picture for policymakers and those kind of making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Hello, Kyle. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey. Hi. Uh, I, did, I I really like the point that you said something about like having something to point to is really important because I'm, I'm actually out in Hollywood now. I know Justin Baldoni. I know Farhad at uh, Wayfarer. And I know how hard it is to get a film like this made. This is not a film, I mean, it, it was third in its opening weekend, which is actually not that great in terms of Hollywood box office. Um, <laughs> don't burst my it, bubble. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm just saying this is clearly, I, I can tell, knowing, having talked to Justin, that this is a passion project. This is something, and, um, I, I've been pitching projects about terminal illness, things like that, and every time, you know, they ask me, what is CEF? I don't, I don't understand what that is. I don't know anything about it. And then I have to, in like a minute, try and explain what CEF is, how hard it's been in my life, you know, the years of hospitalizations, the transplants, that sort of thing. And they just don't, it doesn't register. So now being able to say, oh, go see Five Feet Apart, you'll have a you'll have a, a bit of a conception of what that is like now you can point to it and people will go oh okay and then they'll ask questions then they'll want to know more mm -hmm. and i think that's incredibly important not just for people with cf but for pe disabled people in general to have these stories told because hollywood is not wanting to tell these stories and so i think this is a great thing fantastic thanks for sharing anybody else mary i think uh we have time for like one more comment before we move to the next. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Hi, Elise. Okay, hi. Hi, Sherry. Hi, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I have two comments about um, the film that was very interesting. I went with uh, two very dear friends who I really thought they understood my life having living with CF. And they came out of their wheel. They could hardly Speak. They mm -hmm. said that we finally really have an insight into what your life has been, which surprised me because I felt as if they did kind of, I would say, gloss over the, 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 the intensity of hospital stays we all know is very structured. The thing that was never shown was doctors coming in, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, which I think probably could have been incorporated in a Hollywood fashion. The item that they did do a really good job on, which is, I think we all feel that the hospital staff becomes a part of our extended family because we're there so often. And that relationship between the nurse, who I name, I yeah, can't remember, Barb. and her patients was so touching because I think we've all felt that at lots of times with our space. I always joke that I go to Stanford, it's my home away from home and that's, that's my arts and my multiple bathrooms and everything else. That the, when I had commented to people about the CF world is really, I may not know you, but I love you. We're like extended family because we share this very unique struggle. And I think mm -hmm. the camaraderie between Stella and Will with her peer-to-peer you know, -peer mentoring him and then the nurse, I think that was shown in a very beautiful way to make the film quite special. Thank you. I agree. So, and just so you know, I'm like trying to frame it in these topics, but we know there's, everything's going to spill into everything, and that is absolutely fine. Um, but we are going to move to to topic two. And it's, you know, reading what different comments were out there, some topic of debate has been that the three main characters were very ill, had advanced lung disease, other complications. And um, I really loved what Beth said um, early on that 
we we hear these inspirational stories of people doing amazing things in the face of CF, and I love hearing all these stories. I also, personally, as a person who does not have CF, has a daughter, I it is inspirational because I know how hard it is every day, and there is no relief every day. You are doing what you need to do to stay alive and stay healthy, and that is inspirational as well. So I know, um, there's been debate about should there have been a broader example other than just these three very ill people. And so I'm just curious um, how people feel about the portrayal with the three main characters and whether you know opinions are gonna vary whether you're an adult with CF or parent to an adult with CF or whether you're a parent to a child with CF. And you know, I have, um, we had heard um, Mary talk to a social worker who has families with young children who had seen the film and were very excited to see it. And then um, it were left somewhat traumatized. Um, so I think the, how you look at it, the lens you look at it through is gonna vary. So I'd love to hear other people's opinions about um, the portrayal of Poe, Stella, and oh my gosh. <laughs> Tell me his name. <clears throat> Well, oh my gosh, see, okay, I'm sorry, everybody, I know that. <laughs> so, please, raise your hands if you'd like to talk. Hi, am I unmuted? You are You're unmuted, good. hi, Danny. Hi, um, I think that uh, the, what they did end up showing through those characters is the re reality for a much higher majority of us. Um, there definitely are people who are able to do a lot of things, and that's, awesome um, but if the intent is to raise awareness for research and things like that showing people in their healthiest state mm -hmm. it's great to know we can do that but it's it's gonna I think maybe allow people to downplay the urgent need for re research and money um, so I'm glad that they chose the stories and the circumstances that they did thank you I agree <clears throat> yeah I absolutely agree I know that <clears throat> I recently had an experience when I was in the Capitol um, working on behalf of the rare disease community where an individual was uh, questioning whether CF was a rare disease at all and questioning, you know, how bad could our disease be when we have all this, you know, research and science. Mm -hmm. And it was just an absolute blow to the gut yeah. to hear that there's this perception that, you know, we have these new modulators, so we're fine. And it's like, there are so many of us that aren't fine. Mm -hmm. There are so many of us that are struggling and fighting, my brother included, who are just not in a great spot because the modulators don't work for them or their insurance won't cover it or you know, for any number of reasons. Right. And so, yeah, when you show people doing their greatest, that's awesome for, I think, us in the community to see you know, where we can be. Um, but when we're trying to w raise awareness and get research mm -hmm. and get funding um, it's important to know that we still have so much more to go for our community. We do not have a cure. We are not, you know, able to, mon you know, have mm -hmm. a, our disease under wraps. Things aren't fine. It's a progressive right. terminal illness. And it is still that way for so many in our community. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was kind of tough to see them in that sick spot because it's like I've been there and that is just not a fun place to be. But it is so important, especially with these new modulators and getting that idea out there and the understanding that we still have so far to go. Mm -hmm. Hi, Beth. Can I talk again? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but of course I will keep talking. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting if you say that some of the parents of young children were traumatized by, by seeing the movie, um, because I think they did such a good job of showing them, you know, laughing and happy yeah. and figuring out ways to have fun in the hospital, reaching out to their friends, and the friends come to the hospital and, and visit them. And um, I thought they did a very good job of not making it a, you know, one of these kind of sci-fi. A long time ago, there was kind of a sci-fi movie, and it had a character with CS. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, I'm 53, so that was quite a long time ago. And, you know, it made it kind of a very yeah. scary kind of, everything was scary about it. And I, and I thought they did a very good job of kind of showing um, that they also had happy moments and that they, you know, were were um, doing the best they could. And, ha and I thought, you know, when the doctor comes in and talks to Stella about her G-tube and mm -hmm. has a conversation with her, not telling her what to do, but 
discussing it with her. I mean, I love that the doctor character, and I love that they had the doctor be a woman. Yeah. There's a lot of movies, uh, and also a person of color, mm -hmm. and that the nurse was a person of mm -hmm. color. You know, I thought it was great that the friends also were very diverse. So mm -hmm. um, I thought they showed a lot of empowering scenes with the patients, which, you know, maybe someone with a very little kid you know, is nervous because they see right. someone on oxygen. But uh, I thought they, they did a good job. And, you know, I think um, if you've read about, obviously, probably people on this um, webcast know that uh, Claire Wineland, who had CF, was a you know huge motivating yeah. factor um, behind the movie. And I think, you know, she did all those blog posts and videos and the fact that the cat character Stella was doing that as well I think just showed that here she is she's in the hospital she's struggling she's doing all sorts of you know treatments but yet she's also doing these, these videos to help people with CF and illness which I find found very you know heart heartwarming mm -hmm. and, and a very positive not just oh these people are sick and they're doing their treatments and they're talking about death but also that they were trying to reach out to others, educate others. They were very involved in their care. And of course, when she starts to help him and says, let's do our treatments together. And, you know, I, I just, I was very encouraged by that. And, you know, not that I miss a lot of treatments, but occasionally, <laughs> you know, maybe I miss a few. And I feel like ever since I saw the movie, like, seven days ago the first time, I have not missed a treatment. <laughs> so actually, it's quite an encouraging, compliant kind of uh, movie. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Does anybody else have their hand raised? Colleen. Um, one of my criticisms when I, because I read the book before I saw the movie, um, one of my criticisms was that I felt like they didn't show enough variety, like given that the three main characters are supposed to be the same age, um, maybe they could have thrown in a fourth character that had a pick line that was only there for a day and then went home to finish out their IV treatment the way a lot of us do with like home IVs. Um, but then when I saw it on the screen, I felt like there just wasn't enough time or space to include that kind of variety. So I think like, you know, everything on the screen happened so fast and was so narrow um, that it like might have just detracted from everything to include that kind of variety. But I agree that was kind of like a missing thing to have all three characters be the same age and at the same progression point. Like they're all waiting for transplant. So I guess I, I can see it. Uh, both ways like in the book I wish it had existed but then when I saw the movie I, was, I didn't care as much right right thank you Colleen so um, and I just thank you everybody for your comments I, I appreciated as well because I do feel like um, I talk to a lot of people and they have this sense that we are done we have what we need and everybody's doing great and I liked um, the realism of that and I agree I guess I always comment that for how much um, struggle and pain and loss as a community we have experienced, there's always so much joy. Like yeah. when we all come together, there's a lot of happiness and just um, so much good energy moving forward. And I do feel like that was conveyed in yeah. the film. So I, I love that. I appreciate that too. Because mm -hmm. I know like for a lot of CF uh, families, parents, the way they have a better understanding of the disease is they go and Google it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know when we, me and my brother were born and my mom was searching the web for what CF was, that was traumatizing. Right. And it was just, nothing was good. Mm -hmm. There was no laughter. There were no positive stories. Right. Um, and so that this can be hard, certainly, but I do think you need that bit of reality. But the, you know, offset with the positive, it is so much better a portrayal mm -hmm. of our community and our disease than a web search of right. what cystic fibrosis right. is or a short talk with the doctor. 
and you know, a final thing before I move on, the one thing I really also um, appreciated about it was, I mean, the whole issue about Sapatia is that the one thing, I mean, one word anybody could use with CF is capricious, because, you know, all these cultures that we're also worried about, and nobody actively, like, seeks it out, or it's, it's every culture you have, you're kind of holding your breath to yeah. see, and, you know, that the thing about Will having cultured it and being kicked off the transplant list, I mean, there's the whole thing about his adherence, but that wasn't what gave him sapatia. It's yeah. the capriciousness. So I appreciated that. So, okay, now we'll move on to the issue of cross-infection, which um, clearly has kept members of our community isolated uh, from one another and has led to a climate of anxiety for many. Um, and so in the film, the six foot rule that we all know about, that in fact, we almost six feet yeah. that you know we all know we're spitting on each other um and in the film she she steals that foot back from cf for five um to be five feet apart and i'm curious how people felt about this and whether it sends a positive or a negative message um to others with cf about risk taking or not so i'd love to hear people's perspectives so i had some interesting reactions from my family actually um it kind of ties in with the first question um, I had several that didn't have any idea that there was a restriction uh, between me and other CF patients. They knew vaguely about a lot of what I go through, but they didn't know that. Um, and then I had one relative who actually thought that it applied to everybody and that he had been breaking the rules my whole life by hugging me. <laughs> like just a healthy relative. Um, so I think that in that respect, just the general overview was helpful for people who don't know much about it. Um, specifically regarding the, the way that they treated Stella's transplant process. Um, for every positive that they did with the six foot rule and, and two pre-transplant patients not being near each other, to me, that was kind of negated in the end when she woke up from her transplant. Nobody was in a mask or gown. There was like eight people in her room. She was getting presents from Will, who had touched these things that had probably sapatia on them. Um, so it was, it was great intent, and a lot of people probably wouldn't catch that. But within the community, if you're just learning about transplant and that part is new to you, to me, that was a touchy place where they could have been a little more careful. Thank you. Good point. And your uncle must be very relieved he can hug you again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I figured out the unmute thing now. Um, so, you know, there's like two different feelings that I had when they were talking about um, cross infection. Obviously, it is very important in the community. Um, I am also a little older, and I used to have CF friends, and I would go play with them. They lived down the street. Um, we would hang out and it wasn't until I was about like 10 years old that all of a sudden like you weren't allowed to be friends with them anymore. Um, so for some people they've grown up with this six foot cross infection rule their whole their whole life. They, they don't know any different. Um, so I think and Beth touched on this as well a little bit like we you know for some of us we did grow up being able to interact with other CF patients. Um, so at the part where she like steals that foot back, I was kind of like, I get that. Like, cause I used to have a, you know, close relationship as a younger, like with CF friends. And then all of a sudden it was just like, no more. Um, and this was before social media. So, and I was like 10. Um, so it basically ended those friendships for me with those people because there was really no way to keep a, you know, interest. Like I couldn't go to their house anymore. Like I could call them on the phone, but like you, you, you know, when you can't see somebody or be around them, you really do lose a lot of that, you know, relationship that you have CF or not, you know, aside. Um, so for me, like obviously cross infection is very important and like the audience seemed to catch on to that. Um, but you know, when she was like, I just want to steal that one foot back, I was like, yeah, I get that. Um, 
you know, CF does take a lot of things away from us that, you know, we don't talk about. Um, I do have CF friends now, thanks to the internet. And like Gunnar has talked about, like in Julie Gray, like we can't hang out. I can't hug that person. Like when she got, Stella got so upset about Pope. Like that is very real. Um, so even if it was stealing one foot back, like obviously it's probably not the smartest thing to do. And, you know, knowing what we know now, we shouldn't. But being from an age and time where we could interact and we could be friends, um, I could kind of relate to that. And, you know, like, in, like you could go to the supermarket and be standing two feet from somebody has CF. You would have no idea. Um, so with that mindset, like, you know, we sh should embrace things like that. Like, I saw that kind of as, like, a positive of her saying, like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do this because I want to enjoy and celebrate, you know, life. Um, obviously, I don't recommend it <laughs> uh, or endorse the idea, but I could kind of relate, especially because having friends when I was younger that I then couldn't, you know, continue having those friendships with now and having friends now that I can't, I can't go get coffee with. I can't go eat dinner with. Um, just for the simple fact that even though they don't have Sapatia or, or even MRSA, like I, I don't want to risk hurting them and they don't want to risk hurting me. So, but to just, you know, when she says I was, when she was like, I'm just going to take that one foot back. I was like, yeah, girl, you take that foot back. You take it back. Um, also again, in my head, I knew it was a movie and nobody was really going to get hurt, but just the empowering idea of taking, you know, something negative and, and empowering yourself to take something back when you feel like certain things have been stolen from you. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Kelsey. Can you hear me? Yes. So the thing is, us older generation of CFers, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have that capability of networking with other CFers outside of the hospital. And so a lot of us connected in the hospital together. Like I remember countless times where we would all be doing our breathing treatments together in the activity room, playing on the computer, playing video games together. Like that was how we bonded. And <clears throat> I know a lot of you have read my story in regards to dating another CFR. And it was at that turning point where, you know, the internet started to become bigger and easier to find other CFRs, you know, similar life. And I didn't have that precautions, you know, being put into me, hey, you can't be around each other. And so when I met Heather, it's like, I didn't have anything telling me that this wasn't okay. And it ended up being, you know, three of the best years of my life. And it wasn't until actually being with her and contracting MRSA from her that I realized it was a little bit more serious that, hey, we're actually supposed to be staying away from each other. And, you know, now it's like, okay, well, I have this virus that I need to stay away from other people. But really, it's more a matter of sitting down, being aware of the precautions and if you feel it's worth it or not. Like, I don't see it worth hiding your whole life if it's something that you can connect with somebody and love them and be together like it's worth it thank you your article was beautiful very moving thank you and you know i think about when when tess was born her first hospitalization we went in and we were first put into a room with five there are five of us in the room and uh four of the five kids had cf and then they a room opened up and so we were moved into another room with another child with CF and then <laughs> then it, it moved so the next hospitalization though everything had changed and she was in isolation and there's no leaving the room but she was you know a toddler her first hospitalization so she has no memory of being able to go to the playroom and do all those things and so she she came into consciousness but you know I always laugh like it's six feet now but I think there used to be no feet yeah. And then do you all remember three feet? Yeah. <laughs> and then three feet wasn't enough. It became six feet. So, you know, hopefully 
we stop at the six feet, but it's yeah. been a whole evolving thing. And I, I think that is, you know, what I said in the very beginning about infection control and how you live with that, how you apply that to your own life is just so intensely personal. And you really just have to have respect if you're not putting others at risk and everybody's consenting adults um, about the decisions you make about being with others. And um, I think that's, it's like a hard thing to navigate in our community because people have strong feelings about it. Yeah, I mean, having a brother with CF and growing up together, six feet was not an option, mm -hmm. right? We had the same doctor's appointments, so we can't be six feet apart in the car. Um, or anything like, you know, those kinds of things. And we're always very conscious of what each other is culturing at the time. Um, but yeah, not being able to hug my brother or spend time with my brother, um, visit him in the hospital would be devastating. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, navigating my cross infection rules with my brother is very different than how I navigate it with the rest of the community and being conscious of what I'm growing and being aware of that. But there's a point where CF doesn't get to take my brother from me mm -hmm. and we will make it work. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's intensely personal and it can be very difficult to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. But, and I know it looks different for every CF community, but finding those risks and what's more important than other things. And for me, it's, it's more important to me to be able to hug my brother and spend time with him than it is to make sure that, you know, I'm not growing a certain thing, you right. know? Right. I'll do what I have to do if it means I get to have a relationship with my brother at the end of the day. So Absolutely. For me, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. and there are other siblings, too. That's a whole yeah. other interesting it's tough. Uh, perspective. Paul, yay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's arrived. <laughs> you are unmuted. Hi, Paul. Hi, Siri. Um... Yeah, I, I agree with most everything that's been said. Uh, I would kind of like to emphasize the point of agency. And that is that each of us as adults or, or even pre-adults develop a sense of agency that we have every right to exercise. And, you know, being isolated is a real torture. And being excluded or excluded or banned or whatever you want to call it, is uh, it's a persecution. It just, just to amplify that really egregiously, that's what we do to people in prison. You know, we put them in, in, uh, in uh, isolation is the, one of the worst uh, tortures. And so when I saw the movie, it really became, it really impressed upon me that the anecdote to loneliness is touch. And so if you, if you can't touch someone and you have to stay so far apart, how do you get beyond that barrier? You know, how, do you, how, how do you get to that really basic, essential communication with contact? And, you know, I, I, again, I think it's really a very personal thing and something that each of, each of us has to uh, judge with his own uh, agency. Uh, the ability to assimilate what's around us with what we know, and I, it would, you know, I, I have a real, I have a really difficult time with saying that everybody's got to be excluded or stay away from me six feet. Uh, I, you know, I know there are risks there, but I would quickly say that there are <clears throat> plenty of risk with most of the other people that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and most of them are not concerned or are. are uh, conscious of the fact that they are, um, <laughs> that they carry bugs. Right. You know, honestly, the sickest that I've got has never been from a patient with CF, but with somebody else who sneezed or sat next to me on the airplane or, or something like that. And, you know, they're just not conscious. And so part of my mission in life is to try to train people to not shake my hand because you just sneezed on it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so that's where, I, that's where I'm kind of coming from with the, these rules. And, you know, the, the CFF Foundation, when it came out with the six-foot rule, did that came out like a bombshell. And it hurt a lot of people, and it made a lot of people extremely afraid. You know, it created an enormous amount of fear in our community. 
And the ones that I feel most uh, sensitive about are the young parents who have a child with cystic fibrosis and then they see this and they hear the, all the so-called dangers of to, to, uh, being near a, pers uh, a person with cystic fibrosis and they don't want to come to clinic because they're so terrified that somebody is going to pick a bug, bug up and that can't be good. I mean, I certainly think that there are real rules in the clinic and the guidelines have, are very appropriate. <clears throat> but when we try to take those outside of the clinic and apply them to everybody, we get really conflicted very quickly. So, so what I worry about with this film, I mean, the, the message I got was that, hey, touch is really important, uh, <clears throat> critical to, to breaking down loneliness. But what I worry about is that the message from the film might be overboard with the public. And so people now begin to think of CF patients, not that we're not famous now, but now that we've become infamous, because we are now viewed as having some kind of terrible beta cepacia or whatever that is, that's going to contact somebody else. I don't, I don't know if anyone else is, is worried about that or if it uh, is a, if it's something that maybe I should be, not be worried about, but I do. I, I think that people are going to come away from that movie thinking that we are contaminated and that we're contagious and maybe we should be avoided. And so that, you know, Maybe it's not a big deal, but I, I worry about it in any case, because personally, I don't want to be kept off of airplanes in the, in the future. You know, I've still got a few miles to fly. And I can see something like this getting to the point that, well, hmm, you got to take, <laughs> you're coughing, you can't get on this airplane. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe I'm borrowing too much trouble. I don't know. But just, just to kind of bring that up to, there's more food for thought before we completely end endorse everything here. That is an amazing perspective. I actually had not thought about it that way. But, you know, sometimes when you're so inside of it, you don't see things like that. I mean, in the sense of, because um, we know. <laughs> so, um, Paul, thank you for sharing that, because I had not thought about that. And we do need to move on probably to the next topic. Um, but, oh, just one final thing, Paul, that I really do, that thing about touch being so essential. And I have to say, like, I, I cried off and on through the film, but the scene where Poe wants to hug her and he said something, this, this disease is a prison, you know, I want so badly to hug you. And I, that just made me dissolve because of that, exactly that. It's, it's, it's human emotion. It's this, and then this break on human touch and compassion and the expression of empathy and love. So um, incredibly moving. So... Thank you, Paul, for sharing your thoughts. So now we're going to move on to the part that we could probably go on for like hours about. <laughs> but um, because, you know, there's the macro and is it, what's this for the public, general public. But then, you know, the CF insiders part and, you know, Danny referenced it with the transplant issue um, of her fresh as a flower <laughs> immediately after transplant. Nobody with masks on. So um, I'm just curious to hear from people what absolutely drove you crazy about um, the little cinematic CF inaccuracies. Jacob, you got one off the top of your head? Uh, the lack of coughing was probably the biggest one. Um, I don't cough a lot. I have a lot of privilege there, but um, I can't have like a phone call with my brother without him hacking, you know, hacking up a whole lung and I've got to take a couple minutes to let him cough it out mm -hmm. and then we can resume and mm -hmm. then it's just, you know, when you're down at that low of lung function that you're it's just brutal. Right. I mean, he wakes up every morning and coughs so hard that he'll throw up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just a very daily thing for him. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the lack of coughing, I was like, they, and that is always, I always get that everywhere I go when I start, when I'm having some coughing fits, especially in the morning, roommates or classmates are like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And I go, it's just my CF, right? right? Like, it's just part of what it is. I cough all the time. Right. Um, so that really stuck out to me, the lack mm -hmm. of coughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me as well. Mary, anybody else have things they want to point out? <laughs> <laughs> me again. Um, I also, it just stuck out to me how much, um, for people that were on oxygen, they were climbing a lot of hills and running around the ice a lot. <laughs> I, I can only speak to my experience, but when I was on oxygen, I could not move like that at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> you didn't take out your portable compressor and go sliding yeah. across the ice. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Wasn't a thing. Climbing to the roof of the hospital. <laughs> yeah, the roof. There Just we go. <laughs> Edward. But uh, yeah, married. To, am I my hearable now? Yes. Hi, Ed. Good, good, good. Well, and the first thing I was talking about on that lack of coughing. If anybody besides me noticed that they were really watching carefully, because about the only episode that still had doing some coughing. Uh, Somebody in the crew uh, behind the scene gave her something to put in her mouth, so it lasted about a millisecond. But something she coughed something out. I said, "Well, okay, I guess that was a bit of mucus. Uh, didn't it didn't hit the bottom of the pot very hard." I just wanted to say a quick thing back uh, with what Paul and I'll make keep it really short. I'm 100% in his school of thought on this thing because it, it had been as stringent on this cross infection 30 years ago as it is today. I wouldn't be part of this conversation. And it's one of the things that drew me to the CF community is to see what kind of a community it was. And not everybody's going to huggy, kip, feely, touchy, feely, all this, but they got together in large rooms. The old, first place I have encountered the patients, four patient rooms, and they were quite huge rooms, but that's where they were. And that's, you could hear the younger ones talking to the older ones. That's how people learned about living with CF, what I, how I learned how people live with CF. And when a warrior was on the final trip, there would be a gathering, maybe outside his or her room, but there'd be that, that, that support was there uh, and could feel it. And then we'd generally, uh, particularly both, mostly old, old children and at Packard, there'd be a memorial held and the people would come, you know, other patients, it wouldn't be just the parents and all that. They would gather around to lend support to one another and that this this is an amazing group of people. Sorry. Oh, thank you, Ed. I don't know how anybody else felt, but that five year thing yeah. <laughs> they just kept referring to. You only have five years post transplant, and I just wondered if that bothered anybody. It was not factually accurate. <laughs> it is technically accurate. Uh, that's what the data says. Um, but for anyone who's watching, I'm at 15 years. So there are definitely other stories out there. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's, I mean, out of the percentages, I thought like 80% of people are alive after five years. Is that true? Or is it one year that's 80%? Well, that's tell me one nice, year. tell one year. And then in five years is, do you know the stats, Danny? It's a little higher than 50. I think it's like 60% or so now depending on what center you're at, that, that makes a big difference. And I think that's it. I know enough people um, who've had transplants who are beyond that five year mark that it just kept, every time I'd hear it, like that was the end. You have five years, then, you're, then it's over, so. And one thing too that I've always appreciated is that we're living at a time where as we're living, it keeps extending. So it was when I got my transplant, the stats were like 50% for one year. And now they're so much better than that. So we're, yeah. we're at a really good time for progress. Absolutely. Well, I can say that I'm sure it had to do with just like miking, like as a technical issue for filmmaking, but like the, the when the masks were on and when the masks were off, quite often to me it was like the opposite of when like <laughs> Will and Stella are talking and he would pull the mask down and then he'd turn to go and he'd put the mask on, little things like that. But I think that was like like people in the theater yelling, don't do it, don't do it. I mean, it was, I felt sometimes physically uncomfortable just watching like yeah. <laughs> the interactions. So, um, and you know, let's see, other people have commented on the type of masks that were used Anything else? It means they did a good job. Welcome, Elise. Sorry, it was the technology. It was technology. Um, I realized here, I, I the the transplant percentages was uh, what I have heard is that ninety percent of people survive the first year and fifty percent survive five years or longer. I'm five and a half years out, and I know many people like Danny who are 12 plus years out. 
Um, the one thing about transplant, and I, I, I'm curious if anybody there is medical, medic that could answer this, is I found it astonishing when Will gave her, now I can't remember what the gift of, when she was laughing and crying, still intubated, I don't think that can be done. You're like, you can't do that. You don't have that kind of control. I mean, I know when I was intubated, I, all I could do was sign and that didn't, wasn't even successful. So that was this very big inaccuracy where you have this room full of people. They would have extubated her in the, I would think, and she seemed well enough, but I'm not, wasn't the surgeon. But, um, that was very odd that that scene post transplant. The other thing that they, seemed to, I think, imply was that once you're transplanted, you're all better. And that's not the case with CF. You still have the sinus issues, the GI issues, the diabetes issues. It's just so much more complicated. Um, but one thing I did want to say from a woman's perspective, and I would be curious what the other women would think, is when she, I thought the scene when there were the two of them together, you've never seen somebody be so vulnerable as to show, oh, all of us have all this hardware on our tummies, whether it's our the GT tubes, the Dexcom, the mini meds, whatever it is. That to me was a really beautiful moment because it's something you always say you're not going to share with anybody. And I've been married almost well, with one partner, I think, almost 40 years. And I think that if something happened to us, I wouldn't be able to share that part of me with somebody again. You know, I joke that my stomach is one multiple pieces of hardware. <laughs> I thought that was really, it was very freeing. That was a beautiful scene to me. That was incredibly moving. I, and I, you know, it's interesting that you reference that because it did make me think, of course, of Salty Girls and the, the whole book yeah. that was put out and just how empowering <clears throat> that was for so many people to see themselves and just own it. Yes. And gives us that, freedom maybe the, the way I think so many of our grow as we're going through adolescence you're so self-conscious and embarrassed and it's the idea of it was it was very freeing and I'm considerably older than they are but I felt the same way in my 60s so I don't, you know like as someone earlier said you know just show it girl you know it's okay it was nice that's great. Thank you, Elise. Beth, you are unmuted. So I, I thought that part was one of the best parts of like any movie I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> because not only did um, it show acceptance of your body and of all the things that have, are done to your CF body and all the, the scars that you have that show what's happened, but I think it just, for me, was a scene about acceptance, about accepting yourself the way you are, if you have CF, and how he said that she was so beautiful. I thought, you know, lots of, especially adolescents and young people with CF, do not think they are beautiful. And I just thought it was a very empowering part um, of the movie, I, I love that part. And it reminded me of, and all of you probably um, knew Anna Stencil, and she talked a lot about <clears throat> how limiting her scars were and how she never wanted to date anyone because of them. And that when she finally found someone who would accept her, you know, it took her a very long time to, to, um, be in a position to show the person the scar. So I thought that that part was was very real um, and very true to what a lot of people experience, but also I think gives a really good message, especially to young people and, and also young people who don't have CF, who maybe have something else or, you know, to, to show them that somebody can love you and it's okay to be different. And then, I mean, I've read a lot about the masks on and off of masks or not enough masks. One person I wrote, I saw wrote, they should have been wearing masks the entire movie. I mean, 
you know, it's a movie. I know there was a guy on here who's in Hollywood and, and maybe he could, he could comment as well. But I mean, it's a movie. No one is going to go see a movie where all of the characters, main characters, wear a mask the entire time. Um, but put, and I think that's the reason why. You know, they had to show the people's faces. And, and really, when they were talking to each other is the time when they would want the masks off. But I will say that, you know, I think a lot of people who were vocal about, um, their opposition to parts of the movie uh, may not be very aware of segments of our community who do not wear masks. They don't wear masks in the hospital. They don't wear masks at the clinic. And I think that's, you know, that's their choice. But I almost thought it was very, I don't think they meant, and maybe they did mean this, I, I don't think they did. I thought it was really true that adolescents, for the most part in the hospital, if you've been in the hospital recently, they are not wearing masks. I mean, maybe a few of them are, but most of them are not. I went to the clinic a few weeks ago. My clinic is terrific, terrific about talking about cross-infection. In the lobby, no one with CF that I knew had a mask on, except for me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm big on masks like anywhere, like in the airport, you know, I'm wearing a mask. So, you know, because as Paul says, other people without CF have very bad things they can give us too. And I, and I think, you know, we, we really should start talking about protecting yourself from other people who may have things that can make us sick. I think people don't want to talk about that because it's scary. But um, so I thought the mask thing was actually, um, turned out to be, to me, very realistic in terms of what people are really doing. So, <laughs> there Thank you, you And Beth and Elise, you actually had set up the perfect segue to our final segment, which um, was what was your favorite scene or one of your favorite scenes from the film and why? Why did it resonate with you? And I, mean, I think for a lot of people, that scene was incredibly moving. I'm curious if people have other favorite parts from the film. Don't be shy. We have lots of people who haven't spoken. <laughs> Judy, welcome. Hi, I'm Judy. I'm from Peru, South America. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, and actually, Hi. Uh, you cannot see my face because I'm on transportation heading to my work. <laughs> so, um, as for us here in Peru, for Lima, um, I'm, it's, it's been really, really helpful because people here in Peru, they don't even know what cystic fibrosis is. They, um, it's like, I went through the papers and newspapers and I said, yeah, but it's just fiction. You know, this doesn't happen. This is, this is just a love story. So I kept on like since the um, premiere here that was last Thursday, started writing back all these people saying, yes, it, it does exist. My son's got it. He's 12. The average of, um, of for living for a CF patients, it's here in Peru, it's just 12 to 15 years because of lack of treatment, because lack of um, knowledge about it. So for the premiere, we got the, um, I, I um, got in touch with the, um, this, the, um, the distribution office for the movie. So we got a, uh, like invited a lot of people and uh, local, local artists to go see the movie and do like um how do you say like uh so for people like uh, announcements like commercials and yes. and videos video themselves inviting people yes this does exist i know someone who does have cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. i used my son's picture uh next to the uh banner to, of the uh movie the five feet apart and say, yeah, this is my son. He's got TF, and this is it. This is how we live in Peru. We don't have many doctors. And I even invited the doctors from uh, pneumologists from Peru, and they they went to the movie. And now we get a little bit more in touch with them since Thursday. So um, I think uh, even there, it's um, it's a movie. It's not a documental. 
uh, it uh, has put us on, on the eye of the storm for cystic fibrosis. Only in two days, 11,000 people went to see the movie and they know about now what it is here in Peru and, and that it exists here. So, and for today, for yesterday, 60,000 people went to see the movie. So for us, for the cystic fibrosis uh, community in Peru, it's really, really important that this is showing to, to, to everyone. So um, I know it's, uh, it's different from the United States and other countries around the world, but I think this is a big step for us, a, a huge step huge step. So uh, as uh, other people have been saying, okay, about the masks, about the coughing and about that, all that, yeah, it's maybe it's overact, maybe it's um, um, they forgot some stuff, but overall, it's what we do. You do the treatments, you do the medicine, you do the, th um, um, uh, the, the therapies, you do the um, hospitalization, you cannot, the, my son, he knows that he doesn't have to uh, be um, less than five feet apart or six feet apart from other CFR. So it's, it's been good for us. It's been good for us, you know? So uh, hopefully, I mean, other doors open for the, our community here. We're fighting for that. Fantastic. Thank That's you great. so much for sharing that because, um, you know, it is, we are fortunate, we're a rare yeah. disease, but we do have a little more visibility than a lot of other rare diseases. And this is just such a good reminder too about the power of the movie beyond the borders of the United States and in other countries where there is very little awareness. And yeah. um, thank you for sharing your story and we are thinking of your son. So. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Kyle. Hey, so uh, one thing I kind of wanted to address is the, um, this idea of how important accuracy is in a film. Um, in a, I worked at this institute called the Harmony Institute. It was started by the people who uh, founded BuzzFeed, and they wanted a way to academically measure impact on society by media. And one of the studies they did is, was comparing um, Avatar with an inconvenient truth and trying to figure out which had a bigger impact on society in terms of climate change and the environment. What they actually found was that Avatar had a bigger, a bigger impact because it, it, uh, it reached people in an emotional place as opposed to just having accurate facts. And it also reached outside the box of, you know, you could kind of say the people who saw an inconvenient truth were probably already aware to an extent of, you know, climate change. But Avatar sort of brought that into a broader conversation with people who weren't necessarily interested in, in the impact of environment. And I think when, you, when you're making a film like something like Five Feet Apart, it's important to stay accurate, but also stay accurate to the emotional impact of the film. And if the film resonates emotionally and makes people feel something, that will inherently have a longer lasting you know, impact on what they think of CF than if they were just like, okay, you know, they were a little off here, they were a little off there. Most people will never know that but they'll remember enough and they'll question and they'll want to know more. And I think that's extremely important in a film like Five Feet Apart. Excellent point. That's fascinating. And of course, while I have you there, um, don't go away because I do want to know what one of your favorite scenes is. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, there was a lot of really good scenes. I think the ones that I, I felt a very personal connection to, um, sort of the, the scene where he's standing on a ledge and you know he's kind of considering jumping and we don't really know. And I feel like I've had that, I've had those moments in my life where I'm like, this disease is so awful, I don't want to live anymore. And I know that's like kind of a bad thing to say, but I think that's true to my experience of, of like- Real. Yeah, and I, and I think to, to you know, there is a strong mental health component to fighting a disease that will eventually win. And it's, it's common to have depression and suicidal thoughts are common and we don't talk about it as much. And I think for, for that film to capture that nuance in such a way 
uh, was very honest to something I felt and I, and I can't necessarily bring up to people I don't know or people who know me that have CF but don't really understand the psychological damage that this disease can have. Thank you, thank you. Jacob, do you have a favorite? Um, so I think my favorite part of the movie, so I'm big on like representation and uh, intersectionality. So having um, Poe in the movie God, um, as uh, you know a gay man was really spoke to me mm -hmm. as a gay man myself. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, oh, that's me, <laughs> right? LGBT community within the CF community, yeah. right? The intersection of like rare disease and you know the sexual orientation. So that was so awesome to see that. Um, you know, having CF can be very isolating and having kind of right, non-mainstream sexual orientation can be very isolating. Mm -hmm. And so when those come together, you can feel like completely lost and yeah. alone that, you know, who in my community could I really connect with and the struggles of, you know, uh, being gay and having cystic fibrosis and the unique issues within mm -hmm. that or specifically, you know, other aspects of Poe, right, the, being a person of color mm -hmm. and being in the CF community, yeah. it is very difficult uh, navigating certain health spaces and being taken seriously. And honestly, I know that we've had issues of people being misdiagnosed because of, you know, their, um, their ethnicity. And so it was so great to see some really solid representation and some the, those more unique aspects of the CF community when you get down to it. So yeah. I felt very seen. I Excellent. appreciated that. Everybody loved Poe. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Poe have to die? <laughs> oh, sorry. Spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> Anybody else, Mary? Anna, has some favorites Anna please share. Hi. Um, okay, so I, I think I can kind of piggyback off of what Kyle said. Like some of the parts where they were talking about how the disease makes them feel, because we don't talk about that enough. Um, a lot of us just like, we just do our thing. We've been doing it for years. We go about our daily lives and we just keep going. We don't stop to express our feelings or, or talk about how sometimes the disease does make you go to the darkness, right? And it might take a while to get out of it, especially if you get really, really sick and you end up in the hospital. Or like I just had a recently pretty large lung function decrease. Not sure why. Um, and we're expected to just kind of carry on um, and not really talk about, you know, how that makes you feel about your future or even, you know, what's going on currently. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me, I mean, we already talked about the scene where they, like, you know, are at the pool and they take their clothes off. Um, I'm 32 and I'm still not comfortable with myself and I'm married. So I'm just going to lay that out there that I don't think I'll ever personally be comfortable with the way I look um, in a bathing suit, let alone anything else. So, and I think we need to talk about that because I think that's very real. Um, and the part where uh, they were on the couch, it was like Poe and, and Stella. And Poe was talking about how he was in that relationship with Michael. I think the, man, the boy's name was Michael. Um, and how he felt like he didn't want to be a burden to Michael. And that is why he kept leaving relationships. Even though they made him so happy, he didn't want to be that burden. It took me a very long time personally to get over that idea and to really, I don't know if I'm really over it, but like to accept that um, and to allow myself to be loved and accepted by my husband. Um, you know, to me, I'm always going to be, you know, as much as we are independent, at some point we're always, we're going to be dependent on somebody else. And for us to not recognize that or, or feel that, um, you know, it's kind of like you're living in like a sort of fantasy world, right? So like at some point I'm going to get so sick. I don't know what it is. It might not be for 10, hopefully 20 years now, you know, exaggerating maybe, but you don't, you don't know, but you do know that you are going to be dependent on somebody else and you are gonna need them, not just, you know, physically to help you, but even financially, right? So, and you've kind of like, you've grown up that way. Like I lived with my parents until I was 30. Um, Cause I was very dependent on the idea of, 
you know, financially I couldn't afford to move out because of medical costs and other things. So I think like for that to me was like, yeah, I get it. Like that is how I felt for, and still sometimes feel um, for so long that like you don't want to bring that burden onto somebody else. You don't, you don't want them to have to bear that responsibility or carry that load. Um, so it took me a while to really accept that. So I think for me, like, you know, that scene was kind of like, yeah, exactly. Wow. Thank you, Anna, for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Colleen. Hi. Um, I guess I'm kind of just piggybacking off of um, what Kyle and Anna just said, but um, my favorite scene, which I don't know, it's weird that I'm calling it my favorite, um, was after, um, are we doing the spoiler things? After uh, the car it's fine. Died and Stella freaked out in her room and just like tore everything apart. <laughs> like that was teenage me when of uh, like I found out about like a friend from who had CF that died. Um, actually not teenage, I was 20 something. Um, but that was like, that one really hit me. It was like, yeah, like you hate this disease when it takes people away from you and you just get incredibly angry. Um, and I, I think that all the emotional parts that, um, like the people that know us don't necessarily really see us go through, um, because they're like private to us was important to me. Like I was sitting next to my mom and uh, when Poe said that thing about like, you know what someone gets for loving me, they get to pay all my medical bills and watch me die. Um, like she said that hit her and she never like thought that um, I might think that way about relationships. And I was like, well, yeah, obviously I think that way. Um, so that was like a conversation starter that we had never had. Um, and the body image thing too, I think is so important, but I do want to say once they jumped into that pool, um, any distance, uh, <laughs> like bacterial infection, like water, that was silly to me. But that scene really was important. And I think it was great that their scars, like I knew what all those scars were for. Um, so they were in the right places. That was really cool too. Um, but I think that what Kyle said about tying it to something emotional makes more of an impact. I think that's probably really spot on. And I think it's important that this film showed so many hard grieving and um, coping emotions, um, even if they were a bit dramatic. <laughs> CF is traumatic. Yeah. There's no getting around that one. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Well, unbelievably, we are out of time. And um, I have to say, I have loved every moment of this discussion. And I am so grateful to everybody who participated and shared, honestly shared their feelings and their experiences. This has just been an incredible, incredible event. Um, so. You know, this is, as I said in the beginning, first time we've done something like this, and it really kind of opens a whole new world to us um, for other topics and other town halls we might have. So um, I, I want to ask you in advance, we're probably going to send you some kind of survey monkey thing because we do want to know what, what would make it better, what worked, what didn't work as a, as a participant, um, because we hope we'll be doing this kind of thing more in the future. So before we go, I want to thank again our sponsors, Vertex, Kia Z USA, Gilead Sciences, and additional support from AbbVie. Uh, and um, I really look forward to continuing this conversation, maybe on other topics. Um, but in the meantime, this has been a great night, and I thank you all so much. Good night.